We'd like to welcome you to our midweek Bible study of the Mount Carmel Church. We're so glad that you're able to watch and to listen tonight. And even though you can't be with us in our church building, we uh, just appreciate you so much for tuning in and, and watching and listening. We're going to continue our study in the book of Colossians where Jesus is enough and Christ is at the center. We've been studying that a lot and looking again, at this whole area of Christ being the center of our lives and the importance of that in our lives. And my question to you tonight is, I was studying this, is Christ the center of my life? Is the Christ, Christ the center of your life? But as we've been studying this book of Colossians, Paul comes to this point in chapter 3 of just talking about what we should look like as Christians. Because what we look like to others as Christians is truly showing others where Christ is in us. So tonight we want to continue our study and look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 12 through verse 17. It's a great passage of scripture again and I would encourage you even after tonight to, to read down through that and to mark up your Bible or to look at different things. I have several markings in this passage of Scripture that uh, just kind of jumped out at me. But let's have a word of prayer as we start our study. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for our time together. We just praise you for who you are and who you can be in our lives. And Lord, it comes down to where our hearts are. And uh, Lord, I pray for our study tonight as we look at this as Paul challenges the Christians at the church at Colossae, to just, where are they with Christ? And, and if different things are so, then, you know, how, do, how does their life show that? We'll be looking at that and, and studying that tonight. And again, we just thank you for our time together. I thank you for technology and being able to do what we're doing uh, through uploading it to Facebook and YouTube. And I just pray that People would tell others about it and uh, be willing to share. But we thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, as I said, we're going to continue our study, Jesus is Enough. And looking at this area is Christ the center in my life. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 12 through verse 17. And what I, the point I, I hope that we get to see tonight is I hope this captures our hearts as we consider that there is no part of our life that escapes the presence of Christ. That there's no part of it. He, ha he is there in everything. And that's a comfort that all of us can really have in our lives. Because we, we find out, and as we think about it, Christ is at the center of our lives. What does that statement mean? Christ is the center of my life. What does that mean to you? What should that look like in someone's life or our lives if Christ is the center of our life? You know, Christ is in the center of everything. And how that we can see that and, and think about that. You know, some verses in God's Word that, that talks about Him being the center of our lives is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Let, let's turn to some of these. I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 is one that, as we look at this, is talking about Christ being the center of our lives. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We see one in the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 28. So if you turn there, Psalms chapter 28, and I want to read verse 7 of Psalms chapter 28. It says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song... I will praise him. We also see in the book of Proverbs, another one, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So turn there with me. Psalms, Proverbs, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. 
where it says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall do what? Direct your path. There's one in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And another one, let's look at the one in, in Romans. But we'll, Let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where it says, And I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's go back to the book of Romans. We might as well do our, our last one also. The book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Where it says this, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see... Several places where we see verses that talk about God being the center of our lives. You know, Christ is the center of everything. In Colossians chapter 3, I just want to read the first four verses here. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You know, the center of our faith and our prayers, he is there. He is our only hope, Christ in you, the, the hope of glory that we have. He is the center because of who he is. And he gives us the power to see it through through by, by making us alive in Christ, not dead in Christ, but alive in Christ, forgiven and victorious. And he is to be the center of our mind, our thinking, our decisions, and our plans. So we want to take a look at that tonight in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, and, and I hope you have your Bibles turned to this, and starting in verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the praise or the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all the name of the do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, we see that passage of scripture, and what a what a passage of scripture that we see and how Challenging it is, but also encouraging it is. Well, tonight we want to focus on the idea that Christ is at the center of our life, or your life. You know, this is the thought of what Paul is writing to the Colossae church. Paul is pointing out in, in this passage that there is no part of our life that escapes the presence of Christ. You know, to, to know and to understand that, everything that everything in our life is done in the presence of Him, should change quite a bit about how we react to things, or what we get involved with, or how we treat people, or, or what our attitude is like. Have you ever heard someone say, what if Christ would return while you were doing or acting, and you can finish that statement, what if Christ would return when you're doing what you're doing, or or acting the way you're acting. You know, Christ at the center of everything changes, first of all, how we look. In verses 3, or verse 12 of chapter 3, Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. 
you know, we, we can look at all of those and, and look at all of those things that are there. That word elect means chosen. We should ask ourselves, if this is what Christianity looks like to the world around us, is this what we look like to the world? You know, we all have some room for growing in these areas, don't we? And Jesus is the greatest example of each one of these. <clears throat> we won't take time tonight, but uh, we see how compassionate he was to the widow whose only son had died when he raised her son in Luke chapter 7 verse 11 and how kind he was to a little tax collector who climbed a tree to see him remember Zacchaeus that day salvation came to his house and that was found in Luke chapter 19 verses 1 through 10 and how humble he was as he washed the feet of the disciples showing them the power that of just being humble in John 13 chapter chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. And how gentle he was with the Pharisee who came to him at night to talk to him about being born again, sharing with him what has become world's best love verse in John chapter 3, verses 1 through verse 21. And verse 16 right in that is that verse that we're talking about. And how patient he was with Simon Peter. And maybe others would have given up on him, but Jesus never did. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 through 30. You know how compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, and patient he is with us. And he is all those things and more. You know, right this minute showing he, he, he has all those in us, or shows that all to us. Showing us the way to live. And you know, when Christ is the center of everything, it impacts how we look. It also impacts how we love. Colossians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Bearing one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of per perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of God, in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. You know, we see those words in, in verse, verses 13 through 15, bearing and forgiving and bond, or bound, and peace. You know, the love of Christ is what the world needs to see most. And when Christ is at the center of our, really everything, we will demonstrate that kind of love that he did to others. You know, Paul says it is characterized by love that bears with one another. Love that forgives or forgiving one another as the Lord forgives us. You know, love that, that binds. Love that binds together in unity. Love like that leads to peace. We are called to peace. You know, a famous pastor said it this way, Let the peace of God be the umpire in your heart. The umpire settles things with his decision. And if Jesus is the umpire in our heart, when we are struggling in our relationships with being irritated or annoyed or, or upset, let the umpire have his way, and it will lead to peace. When Christ is the center of everything, it impacts how we look and how we love. I think those are some important things for us to see. What I want to do is, is just go back for a minute to show you God's example to us as we look at Scripture. And as I gave you those verses, I think it's important that we kind of drop back a little bit and look at the, these two areas, how we love. And, and in that first one that we looked at, and we'll, we'll pick up the rest of this passage next week, but then how that we also, not only how that we love, but how important it is that we see in, in, our, in our lives 
how that we look. And we saw that in verses 12 through verse 15 of this passage. But Christ is our example. So let's go back to, to first of all, Luke chapter 7, verse 11. <clears throat> Luke chapter 7, verse 11. I think it's important that we just kind of stop for a minute and think about what our lives look like in this passages that, that as we see here, um, just how Christ was in his life. But Luke chapter 7, in just one verse, Luke chapter 7, verses, verse 11, where we find this. <clears throat> Luke chapter 7, verse 11, where Jesus heals a centurion servant's son. But in verse 11, it says, Now it happened the day after that, he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. See that word compassion? As we look at our lives on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. We also see how he uh, had compassion on a little tax collector, Zacchaeus, in Luke chapter 19. So just turn to Luke chapter 19. I want to read those ten verses there because, again, it gives great examples of who and and how our lives should look. But in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, it says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was gut going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, or look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusations, I will restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Just see that compassion, see that kindness that he gave to Zacchaeus. We also see how humble he was as he washed the feet of the disciples in John. Turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, I, I want to read verses 1 through 5. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil have, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garment, took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a, a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. We see how that he humbled himself. You know, how gently he was with a Pharisee who came to him at night to talk to him about being born again in John chapter 3. Go back to John chapter 3. It's a lengthy passage of Scripture, but let's look at John chapter 3. And I want to read verses 1. And we'll just see how far we get, but it's through 1 through verse 21.
John chapter 3. I was in John chapter 1. Let's go to John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, We speak what we know, and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, and his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. We see where Jesus took a great amount of time here of just sharing with him. You know, sharing with him how to become a son of God. You know how patient he was with Simon Peter, and we could take a, a lot of time looking through the whole account of Simon Peter, and maybe others would have given up on him. But Jesus never did. In the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. We see this passage of Scripture with this account with Simon Peter at one point. But uh, Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 through verse 30. It says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And I think, you know, we can all relate to Peter. We can all repay, relate to who Peter was because he always had doubts or he always had questions. And this is the time when he was in the boat and, and uh, you know, he was there and, and, and Peter saw the Lord walking on the water. It says, Command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hands and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Again, we see how the, the concern that he had, the compassion that he had, the kindness that he had, how humble he was, how gentle he was, and how patient he was, and how that all of those is with us. So as we look tonight at just these few verses, I want us to think how we look. You know, Christ, if he is at the center of everything, it changes how we look. Because as we look, Jesus was the greatest example of that. And if Christ is the center of everything, in our lives, it should change how we love. You know, Paul is, is talking about that in the book of Colossians here. 
And let me read just verses 12 through verse 15. Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be what? And be thankful. I want to thank you for, for listening and, and watching tonight. Next week, we're also going to look at, if Christ is the center of everything, how that it should change the way that we learn. And we'll look at a couple different things here and look at how we think also. But I pray that as we look through this passage, and yes, we're going a little bit slow, but there's a lot in there as we look at that and think about our lives, how we look and how we love. We'll look at the other two next week that we see in the rest of that passage. But let's have a word of prayer as we finish. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time tonight. We thank you for this time as we look at just what it means when you are the center of our life. The importance of that in our life. And Lord, we ask for your continued guidance. We ask for your continued uh, guidance in our lives and wisdom in our lives. As we allow you to be first. It's us allowing you, Lord, you want to be first in our lives. But help us to let you be first in our lives. And we just thank you so much for everything that we do. We thank you for continued guidance and direction in our lives. We pray as we study this passage again that we see how Paul is pointing that out to us, how that you are involved and you are there in everything in our lives. There is nothing that is hid from you. Lord, I think that's just encouragement to us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for who you are and who you can be. We thank you for our time together tonight in our Bible study. And we just ask for your continued guidance as we go through this week and as we allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us. We thank and praise you for who you are. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening tonight. I just want to thank you for being part of our Bible study. And uh, please reach out to somebody and say, hey, you want to be part of a Bible study? There's a Bible study online or a Bible study in a church that we could be part of. I, I would just, we would love to have you come and be part physically with us in our church building. But if you can't come, we, we love having you uh, be part of our Bible study and our morning services on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock online. And uh, we just like looking at God's Word and digging into God's Word. But thank you for watching and listening tonight, and may God bless.